But the collar isn't a problem until we put it in our hands. It's the person. It's the impulse. It's the, in, it's the immediate satisfaction that we need. It's the anger that we can't control, the lack of patience that we have. All of those things combined with the ease of pushing a button, and it doesn't hurt us. It doesn't hurt me to push the button. I, I hear people, I didn't phase them. It didn't hurt him either. So what do we do? Turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Jeremy Moore, welcome back to Sporting Dog Talk. How are you, buddy? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. It feels kind of dumb to be doing this on uh, over Skype like we do a lot of our interviews when we should be getting together in person here and hunting some grouse and woodcock soon. But maybe we'll do that and do a uh, bonus episode from the field here soon, huh? I I would like that a lot. I'll hold you to it. Yeah, we, we need to do that. By, by everything I've seen and everybody I'm talking to, it seems like the bird numbers are really good this year. I agree. I, I was up, um, I spent the last couple of weekends up, up by our place and just walking and, and moving. Move, I moved quite a few birds and the good part about it was I, I found some good broods. Like I had one brood that was 10 plus birds. So if they made it, I'm assuming other ones did. I've had a lot of little groups, three, four birds, but, um, and quite a few singles actually, but, um, it was nice to see that big, big group of birds. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's totally anecdotal, but I, I've kind of seen the same thing. I've been in, in northern Wisconsin quite a bit, scouting deer and wandering around, seen a lot of grouse, been flushing woodcock in random places. Then I was just out in uh, North Dakota hunting whitetails, and I saw a lot of young pheasants, saw some young sharp tails. The, the elk population looked good. The whitetail population looked good. Mule deer, everything looked like it had pulled off uh, – a lot of youngsters this year, so yeah. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this is going to be a, an awesome fall. Totally, and I, I agree. I, when The word optimistic, I think, is something that's important. Like, A, today, I think optimism is good regardless of what you're talking about. But, um, you know, I, I just think that you hear people talk about coming into seasons, if it's going to be good or bad season based on whatever data they've got. I look at it and I go, man, if that's what's dictating whether or not I'm going to go in the field, it's... You know, I almost don't mind people saying there aren't a lot of birds or there isn't a lot of deer this year, whatever it is, because I feel like there's so many people that just don't go then. And I, all of a sudden, you know, even a, if it is down, I don't know that, that we really know, but even if it is down, it could be, a, it could be just fine anyway. I mean, it's so spotty. You know how it is. Like yeah. I can walk one spot and not find birds. I can walk 40 acres over from it and it's full of birds. Well, if I didn't walk that 40 that was full of birds, I'd say there were no birds there. Yeah. Well, and, you know, using grouse specifically, it's so common for people to hunt the exact same spots everyone else hunts and follow those logging roads and send their dog in, you know, five yards off the trail, 10 yards off the trail, and then talk about how there aren't a lot of birds there. And when you, I'd, I'd love to see a breakdown. I know they've done this in other states with pheasants, but I'd love to see a breakdown if you took maybe like you know, three or four sections of public land in Northern Wisconsin, that's got a few, two tracks and logging roads through it. And you could see just a time-lapse of where the pressure was. I'll bet right. the entirety of the hunting pressure would comprise maybe like 2% of that land. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and which it leaves you so much to work with. And so you, sometimes you just, it's, it's hard this time of year and then, you know, the early season to get out and go bust brush, but it's, it's worth it. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it, I don't know what the scene exactly verbatim is, but they talk about like 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water or whatever. It's connected to structure and all that. I don't think there's anything like, it's not like an even spread of animals throughout the landscape, whether it be deer or birds or whatever it is. So yeah, you know, the easy stuff is the stuff that gets walked the most. The stuff that looks good from the road is the stuff that gets in no question in my mind that if you impact those areas with pressure from hunting, the animals are going to adjust. And so I think it takes, you know, that, and that's where I, I talk with a lot of buddies that are like really hardcore grouse guys. And they're, you know, they, they're always talking about how their secret spot, there's so many, they're always losing these secret spots. And they go, man, you stole that secret spot from someone else when you found it. Before. It's not like you discovered it. You're not a, you're not crossing the frontier here. So it's all been found. It's just a matter of how many people are willing to go and do it, you know? Yeah. Well, and when you're, when you're talking wild game populations and the the day-to-day -day habits of them, you know, a, a good spot today is not good tomorrow. I mean, right. you see this in the whitetail world all the time and we don't, 
we don't think about it with game birds the same way. Like if you were if you were to head out into northern Wisconsin right now and find the right dogwood berries or the right crab, crab apple tree, you might find all the grouse in 80 or 120 acres there. And that food source might be cool. gone in two or three days and then they're off to something else. And so it's it's a moving target, which makes it so awesome because when you go in and you're like, well, it has to be this way and they have to be there, it's not going to be very good. If you just go in like, I'm going to follow a dog around and take some new routes, usually good stuff happens. Right, right. Yeah, and it's funny because as – as you change as a hunter, for me anyway, as I've changed experience wise and finding success. And I literally used to, when it came to the grouse specifically, like if I found a bird, I would consider like that was a really good day. And now I look at it and I go, if I don't move 25, 30, I go, oh, it's a slow day. Where back in the day when I walked, when I found three in a day, I was like, this is unbelievable. So I think it's all based on what your expectations are, what you're used to. And the reality of it is for me that it's part of the reason I really have kind of gone back towards, I mean, you kind of sparked the interest for me, rekindled that fire a little bit a few years ago when we went bird hunting together. And I've, I've realized, man, I just miss it. I love it. And the measurement of success is not necessarily birds in the birds in the bag, you know, like that's one of my most appealing parts of getting back into the uplands a little bit more heavily the last few years. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's always worth it. And, you know, I think about, you know, when you talk about how you change and how you measure success, I can remember going grouse hunting a lot of times with no dog. I mean, I can remember pheasant hunting as a, as a, you know, a high schooler and just pinching ditches and stuff going, I hope, I hope we just get a flush. And, you know, now it makes me feel so spoiled. You know, you, you hit that it's, it's too early yet, but you hit that mid October grouse, situation where the leaves are starting to really come down and some of the berries are gone and it's it's a different kind of deal in that woodcock migrations start yeah. to work on through at least in our neck of the woods and you know if you go cover ground with a decent dog it's going to be an awesome day yeah. it's not it's not even going to be just like an okay day it's going right. to be worth it every time and so it's it is it is wild to just just kind of recognize how things change and how you your perception of what matters out there and whether it's worth it to go changes and you know you know you start having some kids and you have some little kids around and you you get three hours to go grouse hunt behind your dogs you're going to appreciate that more than you used to maybe for, as a younger man for sure there I, it's funny you say that there's not a chance i would walk for birds without a dog like it's just <laughs> that is not even like, and it's not even necessarily because of the success factor. Do I think you are more successful with a dog? For sure. But it's because of the enjoyment factor. I don't love the birds that much. Like, I I, I really have a lot of respect. I think they're beautiful. Um, they're the king. Like, the grouse is the king. There's no doubt about it. And I love the woodcock. So I don't, I don't take anything away from woodcock. I think they're the, a blast. But without a dog, I have zero interest in hunting them. No different than pheasants. I love pheasants. Without a dog, I have no interest in going hunting for them. So, um, you know, I, I just think that again it's this whole idea of the the bird hunting for me is something i was into really heavily younger got away from it for a period of time because of deer just focus on deer uh but now it's like i'm getting old and i'm appreciating some of that stuff way more just maybe not more but differently and it's the dog work it's the guns it's the the experience the whole like camp culture part of it is i just i love it um, so it's, to me, it's like, it's all those parts that make this way more, uh, than just shooting free birds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I got, I got a question I got to ask you, but I want to tell you a little story about hunting dog or hunting grouse without dogs first. So when I, where I went to school down in, uh, Winona, Minnesota, you know, kind of across the river from your stomping grounds, we had good grouse hunting then on some of the public land around there in the bluffs. There must have been better timber production or something going on because I could go walk up without a dog into the bluffs around Winona and have a chance to shoot a bird. You know, sure. I mean, and you'd flush some birds. And I remember I took I took my roommate one time because he was kind of a bird hunter. And so it was two of us without a dog and he'd never killed a grouse before. So I put him on the trails and I got into all the thick stuff and I kept flushing grouse and he'd pull up and not shoot. And after like the 10th one, I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, what's going on? And he looks at me and he goes, can you shoot the males and the females? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, 
you, you know, because he'd only ever pheasant right. hunted. And so right. he's like expecting a rooster grouse to come up. Sure. He's going to be able to tell. And I'm like, don't you think that would have been something to ask me at Maybe. the bottom of the bluff right. three hours ago? Uh, For sure. So, so we got her squared away. Uh, I, had a, I had a listener send a question. And it's something I've never thought about with, with dogs. And mm-hmm. so I'm like, all right, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask somebody who does. And, I, I, you know, I'm like, I'll, I'll go find an expert. And so Josh Miller was busy. So I'm going to ask you if that's oh, okay. I knew, I knew you were coming. I knew <laughs> it was coming somewhere there. I was going to say, I'm, let me get my phone out. I'll see if I can call somebody. <laughs> no, seriously, though, this guy, he's owned labs his entire life. And he's on, I think, his third lab. And he said his First two labs were outside dogs, lived in a kennel outside, and they were just workers, burners, ready to go, ready to work anytime he went out there. And this third dog is an inside dog. And he said he's just having way more trouble getting this dog motivated. And he said, do you think there's any connection there between, you know, a work ethic, maybe prey drive, and being an outside dog versus an inside dog? No, absolutely not. Different dog is what, you know, uh, you know, to me, the idea of inside versus outside, I don't think it makes any difference. I think there, the, the difference that it maybe brings up is connection, I think, st- stuff with connection with the dog. I, I think it's hard to connect with people that you don't interact with regularly, like because they're kind of strangers. There, there's a separation there. If you're with them all the time, uh, you get... You get to know them a lot better. You get to, like, it's impossible for me to read a dog accurately unless I spend a significant amount of time with it because I can generalize. And I, I mean, there's real broad stuff, like, you know, basic stuff where I can go, you know, you can read a dog when they get birdie. Like, that's that's a distinct change. But there are certain little, little ticks and little things about certain dogs. Tracking dogs are great examples of this. Like, it would be like saying you could just... Tr- Oh, it's a, it's a tracking dog. I should be able to give it to anybody and they should be able to go track with it. Yeah, yeah, to a degree, but really good ones, there are tiny little minute things that I'm looking for and picking up on from a body language standpoint that tell a lot, tell an awful lot about the story, whatever it is we've got going. So um, I think inside versus outside, the bottom line is you don't spend as much time outside in the dog's kennel as you do in the house. So if you've spent all your time out in the kennel, then, then you'd know, then you'd know that dog a little bit better. But that, so, so to me, those are the, those are differences. I don't think it changes um, personalities of dogs much. Um, yeah, you know, especially drive. You know, if dog has dog has drive, or he doesn't have drive, or he's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Well, I, I, I thought about that when he asked me that from from two different ways because I, I totally agree with you, but I, I thought about it like. Uh, you know, just just as a like maybe a thought exercise, are we just spoiling our dogs and taking away a little of that hunt? But I don't see that out of my dog, and I don't see that out of a lot of dogs. And the other thing I thought about that I I keep I keep thinking more about, and it, you kind of alluded to there with with game recovery dogs, is what are we giving them? So we always think like you know, in your example, hey, let this let this you know deer dog go, and it's going to find that that buck that some dude hit in the guts and can't you know, can't blood trail it anymore, mm-hmm. but you're working that dog on that trail. It's not just let it go. And it's, it's over deal. It's kind of like pheasant hunting. You're like you're working with that dog. And I keep thinking, yeah, we do have lots more dogs that are inside dogs now than we used to. That's like no question about that. But we also have tons of distraction in our life when we're, we're training these dogs. And so, you know, you might throw that dummy and pick up your phone and look at Instagram and you've changed your relationship with that dog right there. And th- these dogs are super aware of our distraction while we're with them too. Yeah. And it, that distraction changes us. Like I, I, we we just got done filming a se- Well, we're not done with it. We're f- in the middle of it. Actually, we're a hundred and, uh, 120 some episodes of it. There's a dog named Bella that we're training. we did this series called Bella be good kind of partnered with gun dog on it. And, um, we wrote, uh, I just finished the last, uh, column for it. So we, we've documented this dog's training from about, she was about 10 weeks old when I picked her up. Um, she's a little over a year and a half now. This will be her first year that we shoot over her. But when it came with her, when it came to her, Ben, who, who works with us here has been filming it all. 
So I'm not filming it myself. I've done that before. It's really hard to do. I, I trained a dog and we did it, put it on YouTube and I, I literally did it with my phone. Um, and so this is a step better in production of it. So Ben's going to film film us doing it. That's our plan. So we've been doing that and the vid the camera gets in the way. Like Ben Ben being there to film it gets in the way. It's it has definitely slowed down. I think the overall process with her, not necessarily in a bad way, but it has I think taken away from a little bit of the productivity that me and her have. I think it changed me. I do things differently in front of a camera. I'm worried about the angle. I'm worried about boring the people that are watching it. I'm worried about whether or not Ben is filming the right stuff and capturing it. Like, so when I'm juggling that ball on top of trying to train a dog, the dog's not getting my full attention. You know, if you're on Instagram and you're looking at something and you find something interesting, dog's not getting your full attention. Dog reads us better than we read them. And the dog goes, maybe I'll give you some of my attention, but I'm not, you're not giving me all yours. I don't know that I'm going to give you all mine back. Maybe they go, I think I can get away with something right now because he's busy looking over here. So all of a sudden your timing's no good. Well, if your timing's no good, you don't have a chance. So like it, it you're exactly right. Stuff like that gets in the way, but it's on so many levels. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we're just biased toward thinking about this stuff as like, okay, is the dog progressing? Is the dog advancing? Is the dog doing what I'm asking? But we don't see it from the dog's perspective of like, yeah, this guy's not really in this. He's not paying attention. I mean, I think about it. Uh, last year, we were down hunting pheasants in southern Minnesota, and there was a group of guys, I think there was four or five of them, kind of walking a line across the CRP, and they had one dog. Every guy in the group had his gun over his shoulder or at his side, not you know, not up and maybe ready for a flush, and the sure. one dog was there walking next to the guy at the end, and they were all parallel, all single file, no, there was no hint of body language just looking at them for 20 seconds between man and dog that any of them expected a bird to come up. And you sure. think about a dog watching you, and they know when you're excited, and they know when when you're in the moment or you're not, and they're going to play off of that. Yeah, we do it in training. You know, last night I had Bella out with me. We, I got a new shotgun, so I was I had to go I had to go sit outside with it. So I I I took it. We went and we we were gonna try to shoot some doves, and so I brought her with. I said this is perfect. You know, it's her first first year shooting over, her, and these are the great little one on ones with her, and they're kind of ex they're very much extension extensions of training. So go out and you know she's very she's real relaxed. She's just got a great temperament. And she's just steady as a rock. And she's a beautiful little dog. Sometimes it give. Sometimes I would like to get maybe a little bit more zip out of her, but that's for like one percent of the time. So I look at it and I remind myself, eh, I'm pretty happy with that being my desire at this point. So she's sitting there and she's laying down and she's nearly falling asleep. And and she's you know there's no action. We're not seeing any birds and. So as part of my training, I go, well, I kind of want to mount this new shotgun and see how it mounts. And I want to, I, I want to get feel. I'm into feel. I like the feel of stuff. So I got this, I bought this really nice little uh, British made double, a little side by side, 20 gauge. And so I'm, I'm mounting it and mounting it. And as I do that, well, it looks like I'm about to shoot. Right. And so all of a sudden she's perked up, she gets sitting. She's, I mean, she looks like a picture. She's, it's great. She looks, and so I look at this and I go, these are opportunities where if I were going to shoot and I didn't have a steady dog and all of a sudden I mount the gun real quickly, is the dog potentially going to break? Uh, so I'm doing this throughout the, the evening and watching her because it's training. I, I'm not going to shoot anything. I'm not paying attention to it, but I'm looking like I am. And as she gets up and gets attentive, I'm going good, good, easy. And I'm just reassuring to her exactly what I want her to do. And so it's, pra it's this practice replica, you know, we're replicating I really look at the first year or two as of hunting over these dogs and shooting over them. And I don't shoot over them really. I mean, I, a year and a half is about as early as I would take a dog to the field typically uh, if they're ready. And so, you know, these first two seasons are going to be really extensions of training. And so it's just the pace that I like to, to go about with them. But yeah, so we're just, you know, let's, let's turn all these opportunities into training opportunities. Yeah. build off of what we've done real controlled. 
I, I was just talking to Tom about that with with young dogs, where especially in the in the the world of duck hunting, which is you know the closest opportunity you're going to get that's not duck hunting is dove hunting because of the steadiness yep. and the the, the yep. style. And yep. he, he was just he brought up you know early season duck, mid season duck, late season duck, and how a lot of people get a rock star early season dog because you got a lot of wood ducks, teal action you know shorter hunts kind of thing weather's nice and then you hit the mid-season when the migration might move out or you know the locals move out and the migration isn't there yet and you get these dogs that all of a sudden get bored and realize there's not that much action or you might get a little flurry at sunrise and that's it and then by late season that's affected them enough where they're not as steady as they were and they're not as into it as as they they were in the early season and a lot of people look at that and go why the hell is my dog slipping now it was so good six or eight weeks ago and it's really highlighted in those young dogs because they're just more susceptible to you know the boredom and the the behavior issues from not having any action yeah and i think i i'm a big i really like the idea of you know culture building cultures around dogs and so this culture of not a lot of action slower paced. I, I think a lot of times we're so, we're so busy. I mean, everyone is busy. And so we, we literally are looking at these little windows of opportunity and time to train. I'm all for it. I think you got to build it in when you can build it in. I think you fit it into your schedule when you can fit it in your schedule. What I think is important though, is even if you have a short window of time, dogs become accustomed to working quickly. Like I think, you know, shed, shed, I hear this all the time. It's one of the biggest things from a shed dog perspective that I see people struggle with is, and it can be any, I mean, it can transfer to any skill set that we're building with the dog as far as hunting goes. We, we train in these segments that are 10 to 15 minutes. We all talk about it. We all want to do it because the attention spans are short. And so we're going to try to achieve certain things in that window of time that the dog can absorb and let that stuff soak in and learn something. So we, I'm big on that. I, I'm all for it. But what I think is has to be taken into consideration is if that's all we ever do with the dogs is real short, high end, kind of, I, I call them high energy. They don't necessarily mean need to be, you know, they're fast, faster paced. Like we're going to go out and we're going to make our five, six retrieves in that 15 minutes. So I watched the video. There's a guy that sent it to me and he made eight retrieves in three and a half minutes with a dummy launcher. And he wanted to know my feedback. And I said, and the dog couldn't stay steady on, I mean, couldn't stay. I mean, some, by some people's definition, maybe it was steady. It didn't break, but it crept. And so he'd shoot the dummy and the dog would go out about four or five steps. Then he'd call it back to him and then he'd send it. He did it every single time. And he did eight retrieves in three and a half minutes. And he asked me what I thought. And I said, in eight and a half minutes, I'm not hardly to the field yet because we walk out really slowly and we take our time and I might throw a dummy or two and pick it up myself. And like all these, so we have, we have these windows of time to teach the dog something new skill. But then what I think we need to spend more time doing is nothing under control. I, I told him, I said, I was out with, I was out with my dogs for 45 minutes. This is the day after I got that video. I got that video the day before that I was out in the field. I had four dogs with me. I was working four of my older dogs. Well, three of my older dogs and then Bella, who's I don't consider old. Those four dogs in 45 minutes each made two retrieves. And, and I said that to me was a really valuable session. Now, I wasn't working on a specific skill. I was working on let's put some of these skills that we've worked on in those 10, 15 minute sessions. Let's connect a lot of those links and have a long chain and let's replicate kind of a hunting situation. Well, what do we do? What did I do last night when I took Bella dove hunting? I stood for an hour and 25 minutes and I shot twice. So it really was the majority of the time doing nothing. And, but they have to have the understanding that that is what we do when we go out in the field. If all we do is go out, get our session in, bring them back, put them every time they go out, they expect we need stuff now. We need action now. And if they don't get it, they become antsy. If they become antsy, you've got a pain in the neck for most of the morning in the duck blind. So you know, part of that, I think it's a mix of getting good at doing nothing and getting good at the specific skills. And I think there's two different places there from a training standpoint on how we develop that and then connect them together. Yeah. Well, you're talking, 
I mean, kind of the way you're describing this is if you if you looked at just taking a dog out to re- do retrieving drills just on the surface, you would think, OK, the goal is to get them to run and bring a bunch of stuff back to you. But you're talking about training steadiness, you know, so you're, you're, you're taking something that happens in hunting, which is a lot of low activity periods between little bursts of activity, but you're training for that. So it's not, you're not going out just going like, okay, I'm doing retrieving drills, but I'm going to make my dog wait for a half hour to retrieve. There's training. The entire space between totally. is, is training. And what it reminds me of, one of my favorite guitarists in the world is David Gilmour from Pink Floyd. I saw this interview with him one time where he was, I think he was talking about being a producer and working with other musicians. And as he got older, he, he said, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm probably going to totally screw it up. But he said, I find myself telling them to just take a break and let let the music breathe and just you don't have to fill it every second with constant singing constant notes constant guitar playing just just let it settle down for a second i think about pacing with dogs that way i I just wrote about that this morning for uh outdoor news and, and early season grouse and how you know, like back to what we said before, we, we set the pace and that dog plays off of us. But when you think about when I go and walk a, a two track, the only thing I got to do is watch my dog and shoot. That's it. And so, but my dog's job and, and I'm in an easy place to walk. Generally, my dog's yeah. job is to go, you know, pay attention to the wind constantly, no matter which way the trail bends and work different cover and figure out where those birds are while paying attention to me and my position, its job is a lot harder. And so if I just back off the gas, my dog relaxes and goes, okay, I have time to do my job and pay attention to him. And the whole thing unfolds in, in, at a, in a better way. Right. It's co- it goes back to this. I, I love the, I love the way of explaining it being, it's just, it's a cultural thing. Like it's your environment. It's what you're raised in. And I, you know, I see kennels these days, um, there, that are, it's a, it's become a marketing thing. It's a branding thing. It's a lifestyle thing, lifestyle images. Like you hear, that's a buzzword. Now you hear lifestyle images, you know, content building, like this is all these these buzzwords. Well, that there's truth to that stuff. Like, and if you create this culture and I know I know many people that have done it uh, really successfully. And I've also seen the culture of, you know, the you you see this cult, you see a culture. I it's just and I'm not picking out or singling out one or the other, but like you you see you see some that represent and, and you and it all starts. It's this marketing thing. So it all starts with websites and logo designs and looks and feels of things, and you get this idea of. A, a more relaxed, calm, um, chilled out, real cool. Like, I mean, uh, you know, if I'm back in the day, like it's, you know, it's like, it's like kind of cool. It's, it's, it's real relaxed. Then you get this high intensity athletic charging, blah, blah, blah. So, and I, I'm not going to open the can of worms, but I don't trial. I don't compete with dogs. Right. So I have nothing against trialers. I have all the respect in the world. I think it's an Im- immense amount of commitment. Um, it's unbelievable. What, what I'm not into winning ribbons. Like it's just not my thing. Some people, it, I don't have that competitiveness when it comes to hunting. I'm a, comp- I'm really competitive, but not when it comes to hunting. And so, and not when it comes to my dogs, like I don't, I don't, it's not my thing, but you, you also see some culture that's driven by like very hard, like field trial type feel, athletic, bold, hard charging. Like that's a culture and that's a thing and there's nothing wrong with it at all. If that's what you're into, that's what, you know, watch the, when you watch super retriever series and those, all those ones that you know, the, the stuff that used to be on the ESPN and all that stuff, like you watch the promos for it. It's fast paced music. It's high driving. It's really fast video. It's showing these poses of dogs, just muscular, strong. That's the feel of that world. Then you look at, um, you look at guys that you look at are more of like the tradition of hunting, you know, like Upland, Upland is, Upland is, this is, this is that thing about Upland. Like the Upland is, I'm not saying it's snobby, but it's, it's can be a little bit, it can be a little bit uppity. You know, it's like, like I, now there's, there's lots of different parts to all of this, but you get this feel of like sitting around a campfire at night, listening to music and 
the dog's laying by your feet. And, you know, like that's a slow image. It's an image of like a real controlled, cool environment. That's cultural. And so when you start talking about the idea of how we're training them, it's like I develop dog's range for Upland by going for a walk with our baby Lillian. I put her in the little cart. I wheel her down the road and I heal. And I, and I develop dogs. So I hunt, I hunt most of my dogs together. I hunt in groups. I don't hunt individual. I, I don't have time to do all the hunting I want. So I hunt with them together. So what I'll do a lot of times when I'm grouse hunting is I'll have one or two dogs on heel off lead. And then I'll have one dog or two dogs out in front quartering. We're working down a, a, a logging road. I'll have two dogs, two dogs usually is my setup is I'll have two dogs quartering cause I can keep my eye on two and they work really well together. And I'll always have the third one with me on heel. And then I'll just switch them. So this one comes in heels for a while. And then this one goes out in quarters with this one. And so I just kind of am rotating them. I've got, always got fresh dogs. It works really well for me. But when I'm going for a walk with the baby, which happens regularly, my wife does it every day, we are going and we're going down the road and one dog or two dogs are healing off lead while the other one I allow to go out and quarter. Let it go, let it quarter down the road. Why not? It runs the ditch. It gets a drink. It, it's not going to find birds, but it's developing range. And if it gets too far, I call it back. So I get to this point where the dogs get to this point where they check back in and they're coming back in and, and they develop. I literally I showed on my Instagram story. I'm, I'll, I'll joke about saying developing a little range today with Bella. She gets out too far, I call her back. Well, I've done that so consistently, and it's a 45-minute to an hour-long walk. I mean, we're walking a mile and a half, two miles. So now we're putting a lot of time, some decent amount of distance and exercise for the dog, conditioning a little bit physically. But when I go walking grouse hunting, I don't walk 15-minute walks. I don't take 10-minute walks. I Hell, by the time we get out of the truck and – get things going 15 20 minutes is done already so if we take the dog out and we take him to a field and we're going to work on quartering drills in a 15 20 minute session and then we put him back up it's not realistic to what we actually do when we hunt and so i replicate that and build it because i took the dogs for a walk and i get great heel work with the dogs that are healing and I can bring it, I can eat, I can tuck a dummy into the cart that Lillian's riding in and I can make a trailing memory. I've sent dogs on mile long trailing memories, dropped a dummy at the beginning of the walk and we walked. And then at a mile, I turned around, and I sent one of the dogs back for him. So there's, those are all ways that are very much more realistic to how I'm going to hunt them and hunt them in the field than it would be a true training, you know, kind of a training setup. Now the setups and the scenarios I get. Yep. But look at the field trial stuff. Those are all setups. Those are all setups and scenarios where the dog walks up to a line. And I, I, I don't know a lot about them, but I've known enough. The dog is ready in the truck. The dog comes out and sits in a holding pit. The dog goes to the line. The dog does his thing. The dog watches the next dog. And then the dog's done. All totaled, how long does it take them to do their thing? It happens really quickly. So those people, yeah, I get it. You train that. You have to train for it. Or how will you do well? But the hunter like me... Those aren't, those are, there is value in some of that, but not the full picture. Yep. Well, and it, you know, I think it's important to kind of note when you, when you talk about the, really not my world either, but when you talk about, you know, some of these, some of these trainers out there really getting after social media and doing the videos and all this kind of stuff, you're seeing an incomplete picture. Right. You, you're intentionally being shown the most badass aspects of that trainer and that dog in the moment. You know, we see this with the phone. Everybody does this. And I, I always think this is one of the things I wrestle with being a content creator is even, even without any ill intentions, it's really hard to show the truth. And you alluded to the, like the full truth. Right. You alluded to this at the beginning with the Bella be good. You as a trainer would have a different experience with Bella without a camera there. Totally. It's already influenced by that. And then if you go into it and you, you have this notion, like I have to show this dog a certain way, you have to make that stuff happen. And so, you know, I, I just, I, I always look at that and I go like, take all of this stuff with a grain of salt when you're out there, you know, and if somebody's, if somebody's getting after the social media thing and they're a trainer, good for them, but you have to understand they're showing 
what you, they want you to see, just like everybody else is on social media. And I, I, you know, I just saw a film pop up that a couple of my buddies made from elk season last year. They went into Colorado, three of them, and they shot three public land bulls in three days. And in amazing hunting, bow hunting, a wild once in a lifetime situation. And the film is 10 minutes. So think about that. You know, I mean, like, think about how much you're leaving out. And so when you see when you see a video of somebody who's got just a, uh, you know, the best looking field trial lab, whatever you can think of, and you see that one minute sizzle reel or that two minute YouTube video, you're missing years of work and training and drilling. And it's, it's such a it's such a and it, it is the nature of the medium, but it's such a small part of what's actually going into this. For sure. And don't get me wrong. Like, I don't, I'm not knocking any of that. I think it's cool. I love it. I, I there are, there are, and it's something that's necessary because there's a lot of competition. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of people out there doing the same thing when it comes to dogs and looking to grow businesses. And so I, I'm not, I'm not against it. In fact, some of it I'm really attracted to like some of the, like I, I buy dogs. So, you know, I don't, I, I do a very, very limited amount of breeding. Um, it's only for me and my clients and the dogs I'm training. So it's so small, it doesn't always work. Uh, I'm a, tr- so I'm a, I'm a customer. So I'm looking at, and I'm shopping and I'm watching and I'm looking for the, the quality parts of the dogs, but I'm also like, there are, par- there are reasons and parts that draw me to that. So I'm, I'm a fan of it. I, I enjoy it. Um, some of it is more my style. Like I, I laugh about it and, you know, I was I was kind of tripping over it before because I was like, how do you word this? But so some people, some of these, some of the stuff that's out there culturally is really attractive to me. It's really chilled and laid back. And like, they're the kind, they're the, it's the picture that I would want to be hanging out in. And I think that's what they try to do. It's, that's the group I want to go have beers with. I mean, some of them I think are like the kids that, you know, the, it's real relaxed and it's pot smoking music type stuff. You know, it's like, it's really cool. Like, and, and chilled out. But then some of it is like this intense rock music type feel. And that draws certain type of people. The other fields draws. And so there's it's what is attractive to you. I love I, I'm I'm really drawn to certain styles. And I think everybody is. And so the dogs are a style. I mean, the lifestyle is part of it. The hunt style is part of it, and the training style is part of it. Like I've always, I've always agreed with, and I heard a guy say this on a podcast once, um, and he was talking about how lining up the right puppies and matching those three things. Like he, he used a little bit different styles, but my, for me, the value for me is hunt style, training style, lifestyle. Probably most in sequence, the opposite way. It's lifestyle, training style, hunt style. That's those are the things that I think I prioritize. Um, and the reason I do lifestyle first is because that's what we do the most of the, the, going back to the idea of the dog inside or outside. The only thing I would say about that is I would never get as much enjoyment out of the dog. If it were an outside dog, I wouldn't enjoy it as much. So to me, that's a big driving force and why all my dogs, I've got five dogs right here. I can turn around and look at five different dogs right now. One's a golden retriever. So you don't paint me with the brush of just being labs, but I've got five dogs laying here in my kitchen and living room, and I I get a lot of enjoyment out of getting done with this podcast and typing out some emails and then looking over and then going petting that dog and then coming over here. You know, it's I wouldn't have that if they were outside because it's that out of sight, out of mind type thing. I th- I'm a big proponent of the idea: get as much out of them as you can. And I have a really small amount of time to hunt, so. Well, Training is more important than hunting to me. Yeah, and you being with those dogs in the house, you're training. You're probably finding a hundred opportunities a day to train each one of those dogs that you might not even think about. Like it's just such a natural thing to work in for you. And I want I want to just back up a second because when you were talking about the field trials, and you know what there 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 are some appealing parts to that, and you know some of the breeding that comes out of that. And what I think about that is. Cause that, that's like uh, in the dog world, that's one of the things I'm least interested in just totally. personally. It's, it's just not my thing, but yeah. at the same time, I look at it like tournament fishing where you might just love to go out and fish walleyes or bass on your, whatever Lake, you know, you're, you grew up going up to your grandpa had a cabin on 
and the thought of competing fishing probably doesn't appeal to you at all. Different world, different kind of thing. But I can guarantee you there's probably things you do when you go out on that lake that came right from people having to figure out how to be better fishermen during tournaments. In the field trial world, I look at that and I go, when, you, when you're asking these dogs, the same kind of dogs that I love, to do these kind of tasks, the training styles or the, or the little you know, light bulb moments coming out of there or the breeding you know, directions, that's contributing to the betterment of dogs overall or the betterment of the kind of dogs I like, I think. And so I'm like, it's a weird thing to, for, as the host of this podcast, it's a weird thing for me to think about because when I bring in some of these people who are in these worlds that aren't really my thing, I always learn from them. And I always go, they're bringing more to the table. Like we just had this, this woman on who runs bear hounds in Northern Wisconsin, mm -hmm. not my thing. I, I wanted to talk to her cause I was interested in the topic and I leave it and I go, I feel like I know a lot more about dogs and people who love dogs now than I did an hour ago. And I think right. that's, I think it's really important to be open to those things like field trialing or what have you, because there's probably something coming out of there that's going to, that's going to make your life easier with your dogs. Yeah. There's, I think, I do think that even if it doesn't interest me, even if it's not my thing, kind of like you're saying, it's not, it's not your thing. There, there are parts of it that are positive for sure. Like, um, you know, and I, I, but I also think it goes back to selecting styles, field trials create are, you know, field trials, require a certain type of dog to do it. Uh, the abilities have to be there to do certain things. I look at it myself and I go, it's ma it's matching up the right thing for me. And I like, n again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want this to sound negative towards field trials because it's not intended to be, but I don't really, I'm not really drawn to the style of dog that does really well in a field trial because of the, what I do with them. And that's not to say that they're, it's a hundred percent one way or the other. It's not, but I don't like to have to put very much pressure on a dog. And so some of the stuff that, that the trials are doing, I think go against, I, I really think field trials are great measurements of trainers. Like if you can get, if you can get dogs to do that, you're a really good trainer. You, you, at training that to, to get dogs to do the stuff. Cause a lot of it's not natural. Like, most of the stuff and that's the that's the part that bothers me a little bit about them is i think a lot of it takes away from what i want in a dog from a natural performance standpoint and so to get dogs to avoid and do certain things to in order to win i think goes against how i how i actually want the dog to work like i don't want I don't want to, I don't use collars. Um, I don't want to have to put a collar on a dog. So if, and that's not saying that I don't think every dog that works in the trials needs a collar. I, I think, I really don't think that. Um, but I think that in order for, uh, in order for them to do certain things that they need to do in those trials, they probably got to use one because it, it goes against what the dog has been built to do. And that you got to remember what the dogs are. I'm listening to a, uh, you listen to that podcast, um, gun, I think it's called gun dog confidential. It's a part of the, it's part of like the project upland group. Um, I, I know what it is, but I haven't listened to it. Really interesting. Like it's, it's backgrounds and origins of dogs. And so oh, is that Craig Koshik a lot of times on there? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So fascinating. And, and I love, I love it. I just like historical stuff. They're talking a lot about history in it. And so they're talking about the development of the breeds and why. And so the reality is we developed breeds for purpose of hunting. You know, hunting dogs were built to, were built to hunt and to help us as hunters in lots of different aspects. The trial system was a way of measuring it and creating standards and, and allowing us to help maybe better the breed from a breeding standpoint and all that. What's changed is what the trials are. And so... You know the trials today here in the states, anyway. I think they I think they require you to be a really good trainer, and you almost train some things out that originally were put into the dogs. You tra you almost train around or that out. And what the problem I see with it is is when it comes to developing the breed, we we use those trials as measuring sticks to what dogs should and shouldn't be bred, and what 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 traits should be passed and what shouldn't be passed. 
and the bottom line is, is depending on your training style and what you're going to do with the dog, if you're not going to trial with them, but they're really, if they're really good at trialing, it's because they have some certain skills. It's been bred into them. Uh, they've, they've leaned a certain way with that style of dog in order to get better. They've improved it towards that game. But if you're not that going to play that game, it's maybe not the best tool. And so I, that's the only thing I look at it now. That's not to say it's a universal thing that if it's a trial dog, it doesn't hunt. But I know a lot of guys that run really successful dogs in trials and they don't hunt with them. And I look at that and to me, I look at that and go, man, what a shame. But who am I to say that? You know, if that's what they want to do with them, more power. Like I I support it 100 percent because I think it's great to have, you know, how much they give back those guys and those dogs give back to the idea of dogs in general. Like so I'm not I'm not against it. I just look at it and go, it's a different animal, uh, literally and figuratively. Yeah, well, it's a this is a wonderful time. to just be tolerant of what other people want to yeah, do. Yeah, totally, man. Well, like, and yeah, I love, I knew you were going to bring up e-collars at some point, and it, I would always, I would literally, and I mean this as a compliment, I would say that you might be a one-of-a-kind dog trainer out there. Your, 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 your philosophy is, I don't know if contrarian is the right word, because it's, I think you follow so many similar paths to other trainers, but you you view the process with the dog differently. And I mean, it probably goes back to your your culture beliefs. But we did a we did a piece for Meat Eater. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So I did a piece for Meat Eater like a year and a half ago, and uh, on e collars, are they good or bad? Indifferent. And I interviewed a couple trainers. Um, on one side, pro e collar, and then I interviewed you on the other side, and you just you laid it out and said, "Listen, we didn't have these for a long time, and we didn't need them to have amazing dogs. We don't need them now to have amazing dogs." And it was a very, you know, it wasn't like these are torture devices or these are horrible things. It was just like, listen, right. if you put in the right time and the and the right effort with a good dog, this is not you don't need this. And so be, be aware that if you're going to this, why, like, why are you using this tool and holy balls, did I get flamed for that article? And I know, I know that you got contacted a whole bunch and it was, it was interesting that you can bring up the debate and, and have people on both sides saying, this is why I love them. This is why I don't use them. And people go nuts over that. Real hot topic. I, we, we, I, I mean, I'll put it out there right now. I don't care if you use an e-collar. It doesn't bother me. I don't care. Here's the problem I have. Because I, I, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, the only issue I have with e-collars is when they're used improperly. And I think the majority of the time, that's the case. Okay? I'll put it out there. I'm not, and, and so if you're listening to this and you're offended by that, maybe you're using it properly and you're not the one I'm talking about. But I know for a fact if you can look me in the eye and say, the majority of people using property, I can call BS. And I think it's a hard argument to say because, and the reason I'll say that is because I'll just go into my email string and I'll, I'll let you read the emails that I've gotten regarding people that have put a collar on a dog. They don't know what they're doing and they have a lot of issues. Nobody needs a license to buy an e-collar. Nobody needs to know how to use it. Anybody can. The issue I have with it is because of that reason, and I've heard, I've, I've listened to it, I've read it, I've seen it, I've talked to the people. The, it's this line, and it's a canned line that you hear it all the time. And it's going to be a little buzzword, because you'll probably hear it. You talk with so many good trainers, you'll hear this. The, I have heard this described as the magic wand. And when you sell it that way, the guy that doesn't know anything, and gr- or girl, doesn't have to be a guy, but the person who doesn't know much about dog training and is struggling... And at their wit's end and need their desperate times, and they'll call for desperate measures at that point, the magic wand fixes everything. So they go, wow, get me a magic wand. And then they pick it up and don't know what they're doing. The same, the people that, the, you know, the, the people that have issues with, I, I'm not, if you use them properly, fine. I don't think you need them. I, I'll be honest. I don't think you need them. Um, most trainers that are good enough to use a collar, are good enough to not use a collar. Bottom line. And 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 if you say you're not, well then I, there's not very many people that say, well, I'm not good enough. Well, it's because it's true. So 
but I just think that, you know, the, the idea, the issue is the misuse of them. And if you, if you had to be trained to use one, like more than just watch a YouTube video, because the, be- the, the collar isn't a problem until we put it in our hands. It's the person. It's the impulse. It's the, in- it's the immediate satisfaction that we need. It's the anger that we can't control, the lack of patience that we have. All of those things combined with the ease of pushing a button, and it doesn't hurt us. It doesn't hurt me to push the button. I, I hear people, I didn't phase them. It didn't hurt him either. So what do we do? Turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. It, you know, I think it, I read a book. Um, he loved the dog is the name of it. Great book. But so it in that book is Bill Tarrant, which is a biography on him. He, he said it was in a, I think he was in a seminar or something and someone brought up the collar and the guy was very adamant about how good the collar was and how this guy, you know, Bill was against, was against him. And so he said, let me put the collar on your daughter. Cause the daughter was sitting next to him. You know, he had a young daughter. Let me put the collar on your daughter. And the guy was ready to literally drop gloves. I, I would be too. You threaten my daughter like that. You're going to make, you're going to say that if someone said, I want to put a collar on your kids, I would literally want to, I, it would be, it would take a lot of patience <laughs> on my end. Right. So, but think about it. That's our response to putting a collar on our kids. Nobody blinks an eye when they say, put a collar on your dog. Whether you know what you're doing with the controller or not, the remote, whatever you call it, whether that person knows what they're doing or not, you get this, you get this sense of the hair stands up in the back of your neck. You get this defense up. You're, no way would you allow it. You, you wouldn't. Mo, I don't know anyone that would, and, and rightfully so. How come we don't feel that way when you say put it on your dog? And so, you know, the idea of, I, I thought about this because I'm going to get a setter. I, I've got a deposit down on a setter. We're getting a pointing dog for next year and collars have come up. I'm going to train that dog without a collar. I, I've already made a decision. I, I've never used a collar in my life. I'm not, I'm not changing for, you know, just because I get a different breed, but so, but I, I'm questioning the idea of GPS. You know, do you want a GPS on the dog? Uh, do you want, I, I like the class, I like classic stuff. Here's another reason why I don't like collars. I just bought a sh- I just bought I bought two shotguns in the last year. One's from 1913 and one's from 1957. Like they're they're side by side considered to be like a vintage double. So are they as good shooting? Are they as well built? Are they have well built probably yes, craftsmanship probably yes, made by hand. I mean they're 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 literally engraved by hand. There's no So I look at that and I'm really drawn to it. It's part of the reason I bought them. I could have went out and bought a brand new Beretta, a brand new Satori, a brand new, you name whatever. I, I could have brought those for a lot less money and they probably shoot just as good or better, but that's not what I'm into. So when it comes to the idea of the dogs and the collars, I'm not into dogs. That, I'm not into dogs with collars for, for lots of different reasons, but it's part of it. It's my style. It's, it's what I enjoy. It's what I like. I love the satisfaction of getting them there without it. it takes me a little longer. No, yeah. no doubt about it. But one of the things about training dogs is I, I actually really enjoy doing it. So the longer it takes, the more enjoyment I get. Kind of look at it that way. Yeah. Well, you're, you're in a place where you're, you're putting in the requisite amount of time to get the dogs where you want the dogs. And, you know, part of the e-collar thing is it's a promise to short, shortcut some of the process. And, you know, there, there's an argument for that. There's an argument definitely for the long range range control and safety situations, you know, being able to recall a dog in the right situation, if it's running toward a highway or a porcupine or something, but it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about it because you're definitely in the minority on that opinion, but it's kind of, kind of where I fall on a lot of stuff too, is I, I go, man, I, I put in a lot of time in my dog and have control over her in a way that makes me very happy. And I don't, I don't worry about some of the stuff that would maybe bring that into the equation. And so it's just, it's, yeah. it's a weird personal thing. I think it's a, I think it's, a, I look at it sometimes as a completeness of training. Like if, is the dog truly trained if he doesn't listen, unless he wears the collar? That's, that's to me a, a big question. And I, I know I talk with a lot of guys that, are, that use collars and that's fine. Um, but they tell me that they'll, you know, they're quick to admit it. They'll say, you know, it's a different dog with the collar on than off. Ab- absolutely. But what's the reason? 
you know? So, so if the dog, I look at it and I go, if the dog, I mean, and I'm, and I'm serious about it. When I, when people say I'm going to put it on because what if the dog runs away? My answer is we need a better recall. We need to have the dog be able to stop to a whistle in a lot of distracting situations. And if you're not there, like I, I take dogs to the field probably later than, than a lot of people do. But the difference is I don't get them into the field as early. But by the time they're, say, three, four, five years old, and I don't have issues with them. I mean, I enjoy it's 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 cruise control at that point and, and and the accelerator as opposed to, you know, we get them in the field an extra season or two, maybe. But we have a lot of issues that we deal with throughout the next 10 years of hunting. And I go, yeah, let's back up and make sure that we don't go into something too early, too soon, not ready. You know, I, I have I've had people ask me about hunting Bella this year at a year and a half old. She's ready. I, she's not. She's not finished by any means. It'll take a couple of years to have where I would call her maybe finished, but because there's a lot of experience she's got to see and get. But but I won't take her into the field like it's you know I the the guy that made all those retrieves in that really short period of time that I was talking about earlier. He one of his driving goals was he wanted to get that dog into the field this year for doves. And he wanted to run, I, I forget what level, like a master hunter level, something, something, something. He rambled off. And I went, wow, those are really as high aspirations. So just take a step back and think about it now for a second and go, realistically, if though if that's what drives you, or I, I look at it and I go, based on the calendar, you might not, if you're not ready to go dove hunting this year, you don't go dove hunting. You give you give that up. I, and there's a guy, a really good friend of mine, that's a really good trainer, and he he's got a, a buddy over in um, he's in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and he said, I come over here to the states and I see you guys, and you guys are way ahead of me at a year old. You guys are way further advanced at a year, even up to like two years. Like you're doing way more stuff. Your dogs are much further along, much better, quite honestly. The difference is when my dog is three. Your dog doesn't touch my dog. He's not even in the same room. Like, because I've built this dog to the point that at that, when he gets to that age, because it's that enough, it's been enough time and experience. He's, he's, he's light years ahead of where you are at with this dog, but you were way ahead of me halfway here. That's like being up at halftime. That's the way I look at it. Like if you're winning at halftime, okay. But I prefer to be winning at the end of the fourth quarter. <laughs> like, that's when it matters. So I look at it that way from a time standpoint with my dogs always. I just think um, I think we can accomplish a lot more by slowing down. And it sounds counterproductive, but um, I, I have to remind myself of it all the time. And I preach it. So, uh, you know, it's not like I do. I do think some people think, boy, he doesn't struggle. He doesn't struggle. Look how look at how cool and calm he can be with those dogs. I struggle all the time with them, and that's why Bell. That's why the Bella series had value is because, you know, we were talking before about image and in some of the stuff we put out there. My stuff, uh, I I'm nowhere near as cool as it, looking and in the stuff we do isn't as cool. It, I just not. And it, we're real boring. Um, a lot of our stuff is very boring. I, I had a person send me a message today that they've watched all 119 Bella Be Goods twice. And I went, you know how many hours that is? It's a lot of hours. Like that person, you know, some people can't watch a three minute video on YouTube without clicking through it. We're not going to be appealing to people that want exciting, fun, fast stuff. It's just not how I do it. But the reality of it is, is even those, even those that market it that way, you can't. You can't be. It's you, like you said. You just you just don't see everything. And I I think the hard part for a lot of people that are trying to train their own dogs is if they don't see all that all the other stuff, it doesn't really help them because it's got to they got to be able to relate to it. My dogs make the exact same prop have the exact same problems and make the same mistakes that yours do. And so, what do you do? Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I'm baffled myself. But then what I do is I go back and I sit down and I think about it and I go. Well, what is the root of the problem? They're trying to fix the problem, try to figure out what was what created the problem, because you might have to patch some stuff up, fill some holes in, do some things. Well, what does that do to our big picture time frame? It might take us back a little bit. And we have a real hard time, I think, 
as people saying we should go backwards. Sometimes that's the way you need to go in order to go forward. Well, yeah. And, you know, one thing that occurs to me when you're talking about, you know, filming the Bella Be Good series and, and showing the the actual development of a dog. Do I, this, this occurred to me. We were, we were filming some stuff with Luna this summer. And everybody asked me about the shake command for shaking water off. And so I said, let's just film how I did this with my dog. But I realized I'm filming this with a dog that already knows this. Sure. You, you know what I mean? So it's like a, anything that we film that she already has nailed, there's like there's less value because now it's just me showing off my dog or almost wishing she'd screw up so there was a teachable right. moment there. But she's got it. Right. And so right. you think about, okay, if you were going to make that with a – Say you're going to take an eight-month-old, ten-month-old, one-year-old puppy and teach them that. It would take you a couple of weeks every day of filming that process mm-hmm. to to get the actual video down of okay, here audience, start to finish. This is what it is, and like you said, it'd be a lot longer than people would probably want to watch. And there's there's a it's a ton of work. It, it is. It is, and it's very. It puts you in a weird place because. If you have the finished product, you want to show that dog off. But the value is only there as far as like swelling your chest a little bit and being like, hey, look what I did with this dog. The real value is in how you got there, like you're talking about. But creating around that sucks. It's yeah, it takes it's a lot. So much. It's so time consuming. And 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 it's frustrating. <clears throat> it's embarrassing at times. You know, there's times there's there have been times in the Bella series even recently well like bella's been a great little um she's been great in a lot of aspects to show because a overall i give her like a if you gotta letter grade it she's like a she's an a minus a b plus really good like right now overall like everything but there are so some things she's done that are just supernatural and like I show them and I feel really good about myself and I didn't have anything to do with it. She did it. She knew it. She had it. I just brought it out of her. And so that makes me feel good and it looks really good. People don't gain a lot from it because the people, a lot of, some people that are, have their dogs, their dog doesn't have that so natural and they struggle with it. So I'm not helping them by showing her to do it real natural. I'm making them feel a little bad about themselves probably. But then there's certain things that I think she should do a lot better. She doesn't. And I look at it and I go, it's in, oh, what's wrong with her, you know? And I'm and I'm set, set, sitting there going, did I do it? Is it something I did in the training to get to this point where I did I not do something? Did I do something that created this? So, you know, it's real exposing and real. You become very vulnerable. Uh, YouTube, I have found that fa- fa- Instagram I love, Facebook sucks, and YouTube is following up pretty closely to it. And I, and I say that a little bit jokingly because I love I, I love them all, but it's like you have this um, it's like a it's like this unfiltered medium for people to just be jerks, like real assholes. Like YouTube, I find it a lot where you get you get and it's not like it's a million people, but it's like one or two people that are a constant thorn and want to be this armchair quarterback and go, you should have done this, you should have done that, you should have done that, and I you know. You're right. I probably should have, but I want to see your video when you're training the dog and I want to see how you respond to it. And I want to see how you do it in the moment. It's real easy to sit back and look at it. That's what, that's the nice part for me in the series is I've learned a lot about myself and the dog by watching it and realizing well, there are a lot of things I would have probably done different. There's a lot of things that I think we did pretty good. It's admitting that, you know, and so it's easy to, it, but, the, but, but here's the thing that's easy to keep it going is all the positive support you get. Like I get so many messages that go, I'm so glad you're doing this because the best one I – the one I've enjoyed the most was an absolute cluster. Like it was just a mess. The shit went wrong in every way it could. But how do you respond to that? Because when I – because, you know, these people that are messaging me are going, that's every day for me. And so – I don't know how to dig out from under that, from that, from that hole. And so, you know, I, I, I don't, it, you, it's, it's boring. It's not polished. It's, but you know what? Like I talked about styles, maybe that is our style and maybe I just need to embrace it a little bit, you know, and be like, eh, okay, we're not going to be as, we're not going to have, we don't have like, we don't have fancy 
camera work. Like we don't have beautiful images. We don't have these great marketing tools. But what are we marketing? Like I'm not selling a dog. I'm not, you know, I'm 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 kind of selling training, I guess. But a lot of it we're just giving it to you anyway. So they're not really selling it. Like you can get as much out of our series on YouTube, our playlists, as you can get out of our formal training videos. We sell the formal training videos, three and a half hours long. You could spend, like that guy did, 118 videos, watch them twice, and you probably get more out of that than you do with the training video. And that's free. You know, that's on YouTube. I look at it and I go, if we can help people that want to do it themselves, I'm not looking to change anybody's train styles that's set in their ways. If you use a collar, I'm not looking to say you shouldn't use a collar and you should change to my way. No, our way, it's not even my way. It's just a way. But it's for those who are trying to find something that's going to fit for them, if you're trying to find something that's going to fit for their dog, that's, to me, that's where we hopefully are be able to bring some value. Yeah. Yeah. A couple things on that. Don't read the comments. Uh, it's a bad yeah. idea. And I, I heard a statistic the other day, I think it was for Twitter, where 80% of the comments are generated by 2% of the users. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that YouTube is of a similar ratio where there's a very small percentage of people out there creating. I mean, it, and I, I know this to be true because I've had people, I, I don't know that to be true. I assume it's true because I've had people send me emails and be like, you should have never said this or you should have never done that. And, or your guest said this and it's totally wrong. And then I'll Google that person and they're out there everywhere doing that to everyone. Sure. And I'm like, what's going on in your life? Like, yeah. I, I really, I do. It takes me from immediate anger to, I go, God, I, I hope you figure out a way to get happy. Cause you're clearly, this is not a good hobby. This is not the right. way you want to spend your life. And so it is, it is a, it's a weird world out there when you're creating content like that, but the, the positives to the negatives are, it's, it's so weighted toward the positive and it, and you're, and you're doing good things out there. Um, we got to wrap this up, but I got to ask you why, why a setter? Why now? Uh, I've never had, never had a pointing breed, um, really interested in them because of the, uh, rekindled fire in the uplands, specifically grouse and woodcock. So I bought a dog that's like, I, I looked for a dog for three years. I talked to over a dozen kennels. Um, I found what I think is the right one. He's over by you. Uh, well, he's in Minnesota, but yeah, Minnesota, he's in Minnesota. Um, where Northwood's, at? Bird, where? Northwood's bird dogs, Jerry Coulter. Um, he's in Sandstone, just yep. south, south of Duluth. Um, fantastic people. Like the, probably the, there's a lot of really good dogs out there. And I know that, um, lots of them but what sold me on them was them uh we went to the camp we spent the day there uh me and three buddies four buddies went there we spent the day with them um we looked at lots of different dogs he worked some of their dogs for us they were like so welcoming and willing to spend the time uh i looked at that and i went you know what that that's what sets apart a kennel to me because if I'm having issues with a dog down the road, if I bought a dog from someone and I'm having issues with them and I can't get a hold of them when I'm a potential customer, how are they going to treat me when I'm having an issue? You know, like I think that's a real important part of the business. So, you know, the dogs are very important. Uh, there's a lot of good ones out there. These, the, the thing that really sold me on it was the people in combination. So we, so we're going to, so setter because I was pointer originally. I was, I was set on pointer. I was set on LHU pointer. Um, I dug into it a little bit more. I think for where I hunt and how I hunt and the lifestyle that we're these dogs are going to live in the house with us. And I'm not saying pointers can't and don't. I'm saying the setter, from what I understand, from what I have seen, will fit into our family a little bit better. Will fit into our house a little bit better. Um, I love the classic part of it. I love the idea. Uh, there is a bit of romanticism to hunting over a setter in the North Woods. Um, with, you know, I've, I've got, I bought two shotguns. So I bought a Fox Sterling worth and I bought a Webley and Scott. So I've got a British made gun and I've got an American gun. And I think they're both super high. We were talking about the quality aspect before. And why do I buy something that's a hundred years old or older? Because it was made better then than it is today. And I like that, but it was made by hand, you know? And so the, I, so I, so all those reasons. And then because I need to become a better trainer. 
And so I love I love the Labrador. I love the British style, the UK style dog. Um, fits fits me really well. I want to get I want to expand. I got a golden retriever here right now that's from American Field Trial Alliance, my parents' dog. And I know why I don't buy those dogs. Like it doesn't fit exactly with my style. Uh, can we do some things to help my parents? That's the plan. Um, the dog is just too much for them right now. And so we're working on it. Um, but the setter I think is going to be, I'll become a better trainer for it. Um, I'll learn a lot from it. Um, I think I'm really going to enjoy it. I mean, I'm to the point now where I know I'll hunt it. I, I the last few years have, have, have told me, if I had if I had one, I'd have done it justice by getting it into the woods enough. So I'm gonna work it with our with the Labradors. I'm gonna work the dogs to work the labs to heal, work the work the pointing dog, and then I'll use my. I don't care if the dog. I don't care if the setter retrieves or not. I think a lot of them have that natural instinct, particularly um, Jerry's dogs. But uh, I don't care about that part nearly as much. Um, from a retrieving and game game finding standpoint, I'm I'm in really good shape with. It. So I'll hunt the dogs together. Yep. Um, I'm ex- I, I, it's, it's just another challenge. It's another thing. I've got a lot of buddies that are really excited about it because I told them I'm going to do it without a collar and they're pointing dog guys. And they said, I can't do it. So I'll do it. And, uh, I don't know, maybe it won't work out that well, but I got a feeling that it will be just fine. Um, and it'll be, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I, I, I can't wait. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be really neat. You're in a place where that dog, is going to have a pretty good life. I think in, unless some disease comes through and wipes out all the grouse and woodcock, I think that dog is going to be pretty happy in a couple yeah. of years. Uh, yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on. Where can everybody find you out there on social and YouTube and all that good stuff at Dogbone hunter. That's all of our social stuff and dogbonehunter.com. So at Dogbone hunter is the, the easy way to search it.